So, you're saying we're not alone in the universe? That we aren't the only intelligent creatures, and that contact is possible at any moment, even right now? Yes. But it won't be anything like that which you read in science fiction novels. There, aliens always want something from us. Without that, we probably feel unneeded. The only way we can envisage a contact is in our own image. We can't imagine it without a consumerist goal. A very clear one. Either they conquer us, or we conquer them. What if the very notion of conquest is unknown to them? Just like there's no benefactor complex, they can't imagine how you could possibly intervene in another's development by giving them magical gifts, such as extended life, knowledge, healing powers, new energy sources, or the ability to solve any problem. We're looking for equally intelligent beings, millions of light years away. It's expensive, but perfectly safe, because there's no need to change anything in ourselves to do this. But what if other forms of intelligence were to be found, not in faraway outer space, but within reach? Rather than suddenly arriving, they were always here even well before our arrival, and entirely devoid of any intention of satisfying our whims. For example, any desire to conquer and enlighten us. They need nothing from us. They do not need our flesh, our democracy, our so-called philosophy, our economy, even our land. To all of this, they're completely indifferent. However, not to everything. Our true feelings, our inspiration, our passion and our love. Us, the way we are in reality, naked and perfect, free from any artificiality. Their home covers three quarters of the Earth's surface. We live on islands surrounded by their home. They are looking after the world's oceans, after the water, without which life is impossible. On this planet, this is the most important thing anyone could be looking after. They see how, as the result of our actions, the Earth is dying before our very eyes. How corals are turning grey. How the diversity of marine species is diminishing. How coasts are turning into rubbish dumps. They see no point in interacting with who we are at present as from a rational point of view, it seems impossible to communicate with us. Also, because they know how afraid we are of this contact, because we sense, on some base animal level, that it will force us to reconsider the very foundations of how we live. Good psychologists have a rule. There should be no intervention without being asked. There's no request coming from us. We have gone too far to be able to formulate it. 
and they have no reason to insist. They live nearby, but we fail to acknowledge them as our equals in intelligence. Do we not see the evidence that this is what they are? They're in front of our very eyes, but we're more comfortable pretending we don't see them. Apparently, such contact did once exist. In ancient Greek, the word dolphin itself meant brother. Back then, humans had not yet lost contact with the world and they treated nature as something sacred and alive. What remains of this knowledge can still be found today in artifacts of different cultures, but even more so within ourselves. All cultures have very similar myths about whales and dolphins. At different latitudes, there are sacred places associated with them. They feature in the legends of Atlantis, the Flood, among the ancient Greek gods, Delphi, the city of the greatest oracle in history. Dolphins are the eternal symbol of harmony, freedom, strength, mystery, life itself, and always of salvation. There is no other creature on Earth that unites all these concepts. And there's no other creature that evokes so much pure joy in every human. Which means that we've always had this knowledge of them being, in fact, bearers of all these qualities. This connection with them is inscribed, hardwired in us, in our consciousness. Children who haven't yet begun to speak, who have never seen the sea, smile when they see an image of a dolphin. The dolphin is a totem of the human race, a symbol of kinship and protection. We have one common address, but they remember it. We, on the other hand, are suffering from amnesia. The moment we leave our state of senselessness, the contact will be established. We know that recognizing oneself in the mirror is evidence of self-awareness. When the mirror self-recognition test was invented, dolphins were among the first to pass it. Individual human beings can pass it at the age of one and a half years. But has humanity as a whole reached that age? They are our mirror self-recognition test, a doorway through the looking glass. For us to be able to recognize ourselves in them, in some very essential aspects, they have to be similar to us. Yes, the question is, 
what is really important for us. If we went to another planet, what would we hope to have in common with its inhabitants? A similarity in technologies, in lifestyle, or in the presence of love, mercy and joy in their lives? They are amazingly similar to us, but their abilities are astonishing. They live in contact with a world that is unattainable for our senses and our science. They are fantastically harmonious. They are one with the ocean, with its vitality, its tenderness. They draw energy from the very instant and place where they need it. Their altruism, friendship, loyalty, affection, concentration are incomparably higher than ours. They travel holding hands. They give each other gifts, creating amazing works of water and air, unique and instantaneous, a state of happiness itself. Being separated from their families drives them insane. They are ready to sacrifice themselves to save their loved ones. Humans and dolphins are the only species on the planet that make love face to face. Everything they do is permeated with love. Whether relaxing, socializing or playing, they fill almost every movement with love. They take every breath with awareness from the very first one. They come into the world in a different way without any need for a long awakening of consciousness. Their passage into consciousness is momentary, instantaneous. They are born aware. Like us, they feed their children with milk. Like us, they pass on the most important thing, knowledge about the world and their place within it, and about life. However, it looks nothing like our school curricula. We call it culture. Theirs is different. From our point of view, there is nothing for consumption only for construction.
We are the only real threat for them. Hunting, captivity in aquariums, polluted oceans, unbearable noise. Why, being so intelligent, do they put up with this? Specifically because they're intelligent, in a sense that surpasses our usual conception of that term. Because in their world, shooting someone else, you inevitably hit yourself. The French word Dauphin means king's heir, crown prince, the eldest son who is to be crowned as king. They're 50 times older than us, and they treat us very much like we treat children. The wisest among us used to say, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to do the heart's work, the embodiment of love. For no other ability is more important. Teach us to be mindful, for there's nothing else of value. Not to seek pleasure, but to create joy. Not to be cruel, not to fight wars, but to love. If I can speak languages and have all the knowledge, but don't have love, I'm but an empty vessel, and I'm of no use. The only purpose of education is to pass on a worldview, a vision of the world that generates behavior that isn't conditioned by external circumstances. Not reactive, but coming from within, a code of life. Dolphins have it. One point will suffice to prove it. They don't retaliate for the pain we inflict on them. The natural world's most powerful predators they can kill us with one blow of a tail, but they never do it, even to protect themselves from violence. They have a built-in, unconditional prohibition on causing harm to humans that overrides even the instinct of self-preservation. Because if you're capable of killing children, you're insane. It's been said, be like children and enter the kingdom of heaven. Crowned as kings, what do we teach our children so that they won't miss out on the most important things in life when they grow up? What kind of princely schooling have we invented for them and what will they inherit? What answers to the main questions can we pass on to them? As you treat others, so shall you be treated. It's not that they value our lives more than their own. It's because they value us more than we value ourselves. In us, they see something we ourselves don't see. In order to live like this, an amazing language is needed, an ability to speak to one another and the world as equals. They have such a language, a language quite unlike ours, a different kind of relationship with the world and a different language. There's a language for solid forms and definitions and there's a language for fluidity and infinity. We have something similar, music. Once it was not only a diversion, it was also a means of enchantment, healing, a dialogue with nature. 
Such a language cannot be memorized through repetition. It won't work, because every moment is unique. Every thought, feeling, movement, or word in it generates a wave that changes the world. Sadness, anxiety, joy, gratitude. We not only experience them, we radiate them. This language is not just a way of describing the world, but an action that allows the recreation of the universe anew each and every time. Once a year, whales gather in several points around the globe. For two weeks, they suspend all activities except one, surfacing only to breathe and dive again. The rest of the time, they hover vertically at shallow depths and sing. Could it be the very word we have forgotten that was the beginning of all beginnings? They literally see sounds, like musicians of genius, and they feel it. The rhythms of their songs are unlike any other patterns, except those of the chants of monks in a handful of monasteries, where they still remember how it is done. In what kind of space do they intersect? The ocean is a gigantic amplifier. When beauty sounds within it, harmony is created. When terror sounds within it, destruction intensifies. What we do to water, the deafening noise with which we have filled the ocean, causes their brains to bleed. They go mad and strand themselves on beaches.
each of them has a brain that is far more developed than ours. It seems very strange. After all, in our understanding, they don't create anything. So what do they do? They produce nothing that is material, nothing palpable. But for millions of years, they have retained giant brains and the largest hearts in the world. It means that both are needed now and always. It means that this is necessary for whatever they are doing here, or what is being done through them. It's something an intelligent mind should be able to do. Water, a tangible wave, is a perfect conduit between the unmanifested and the material, between the potential and the embodied. It's a habitat that consists of building blocks for miracle working. We are only able to see frozen shapes. They see the process of creation itself and they are mindfully involved in it. This is not mysticism. It is a different physics. A magnum opus. Between breathing in and breathing out, there is a certain free space, a rabbit hole designed to allow a leap from one opportunity to another, the space where miracles happen. They live holding their breath, and they are never fully asleep. They are the only creatures on the planet who constantly remain alert lucid dreaming, a cherished aspiration of all creative minds, deep meditation, the main secret of all spiritual teachings. If humans are the crowning glory of creation, it is because of our ability to create, to realize what we conceive, to make what did not exist before, to connect the possible and the real, to extract the best future from a space of possibilities. Apart from them, there are no other teachers on the planet who can teach us all we need to know to do this. Just in time, 
before we unlearn all this entirely, before we lose the ability without which we can do nothing but perpetually chase after survival. In spite of all this, we still don't acknowledge them as sentient beings. How is this even possible? According to one definition, intelligence is an ability to use the powers of the world without destroying that world. It's rarely remembered, because for humanity, it sounds like a condemnation. The intelligence tests to which we've subjected them say more about us than about them. What test can a caterpillar offer a butterfly? In our difficult cohabitation, we're too preoccupied with ourselves to be able to clearly see them. But most importantly, we see no reason to do so. We're looking for practical benefits and they have nothing to offer for our consumption except themselves. They do not build megacities, do not improve amenities, do not protect property. They're indifferent to technology, business and politics. They have no economic reforms, peacekeepers with guns, priests on the payroll, no private possessions and no immovable property. They do not make things immovable. For them, the idea itself is equivalent to death. Instead of charity, they have compassion. Instead of diplomacy, sincerity. Instead of museums, live art. Instead of power stations, direct contact with energy. Our high-rise office buildings, long-term plans, legal acts, scandalous divorces, concrete fences, frozen food, amusement parks, Property divisions, world championships, potency boosts, highly placed officials, stockbrokers, driving licenses, tax declarations, solemn vows, membership cards, elite schools, contraceptives, silicone beauties, messianic ambitions, exhausting diets, society routes, career advancements, fashion accessories, all those other things that constantly worry us, disrupting our sleep, all of that has no purpose or meaning for them. There's nothing we can take from them as they have no possessions. Unlike us, they know they don't own the world and the strength given to them. The ocean, light, freedom, no one can own them. All that we can gain from contact with them has already been given to us. But to accept it, we must change our view of the world. But that is unbearably difficult for us we would have to reject the piles of nonsense that we saw as our world, our values and ourselves.
We are, in fact, aware that everything we've invented and used as reference points has expired. There are no more solutions within our previously established picture of the world, but we desperately cling to it, unable to believe that we've already created insurmountable circumstances where the very notion of resistance is meaningless. Behind our aggressive force, there is fear, disunity, and helplessness. We're trying to stop a war with new wars. They have no answers as to how to arrange things for the consumer. And we do not know yet how to ask different questions. And yet, at least at an individual level, this kind of contact is possible. Yes, en masse, we cannot slip through the eye of the needle. It is about your choice. But if you make up your mind, what awaits you is a very risky experience. If you are not ready to go through with it, if you are here only out of curiosity, there will be no encounter. They will leave, because it can knock you off your feet. It leaves no stone unturned in the fortress that you have been building around yourself for years. You took that step into the vortex and emerged in another universe. You will make your way back to the shore but you will never be the same. Not because you met someone else, but because you have come to know yourself. What happens at such a moment cannot be described with words. You live in a house where the lights are permanently off. It would be enough to press the switch button, but you get accustomed to doing everything by feel in the darkness. You beat a narrow path through the invisible piles and, having learned it, convince yourself you have photophobia. Then suddenly you decide to turn on the light and go blind to the past. Somehow 
you do not seek contact with us in any way, except when there's a physical need to save us. They are not humans. They cannot talk out of fear, politeness or boredom. Instead of pity, there's care. Instead of rules of propriety, there's authenticity and honesty. Instead of entertainment, there's interest. It's a different level of respect. It is impossible to extort what is given freely. You cannot pretend to be someone else for the sake of a nice photo. When you are being x-rayed, you cannot pretend to be someone you are not. There is nothing to negotiate. If you are not genuine, there will be no contact. This contact has no other purpose. It provides just one thing. It forces you to irreversibly change your life. You will cease to take interest in much of what was previously so important. Issues, activities, goals, acquaintances. Once the tears dry, you'll realize that you have new eyes. The most important thing has happened to you. A change in the position of the observer. A whale is growing inside you. He is remodeling you from the inside. From this moment on, you are no longer cut off from the world. You become equal to your own self. It is a very strange contact, one in which we can find ourselves, a fleeting contact. It's a contact that people always seek and always fear. To notice means to acknowledge and accept, then there'll be no going back. If you love someone, you give them full and unconditional freedom of choice. Until we are ready, such a contact would be premature. Untimely kindness is evil. Their attitude shows respect for our choice and our way, whatever they are. You cannot force somebody to be themselves. Nothing is done against our will. This has been going on for a long time, but now we're about to take the final exam, and there'll be no resitting that exam. What we have done to the planet has put it on the brink of extinction. This cannot go on any further. It's about time we introduced ourselves. Dolphins, humans. Humans, dolphins. We can bury our heads in the sand again. We can continue to see them as funny animals, as material for animal feed, the entertainment industry, and military amusement rides. Yet, in doing so, we choose not their destiny, we choose ours. They will not say, thank you for the fish, and fly away to a distant star as shown in the well-known book. They do not have much to thank us for, and nowhere to fly to. This is their home. Dolphins are the imminent consciousness of our world. We can go on killing our own kind. That's our business. Changing our attitudes towards them. That is our real initiation. Our transition from barbarity to maturity.
The world is not perfect because it's not complete. The eighth day of creation is nearing its end and its outcome depends on our maturity. When we are mindful, we enter the contact zone. Not when, having caught a glimpse of those amusing animals, we jump into the water to join them, but when we are mindful, wherever we are, on land, in the city, at home, an encounter that can take place anytime. It depends on a viewpoint and has a single address. When everything is to be decided towards evening, they appear inactive to many. What can you do? It's not with a carrot and stick, but through their presence that real teachers impart their teachings. Observation can change the object's behavior. They are watching, and this is our opportunity to change. They know us who we are and who we can be. The mirror is still transparent on one side. They can see us while we don't see them. As soon as we are able to discern them, nothing will be denied to us. Perhaps somewhere in the universe, there is other intelligent life. But surely our planet, here and now, has two forms of intelligence, one of which bases its life on the conquest of nature and development of technology, and the other on a harmonious and joyful communion with the universe. The former can probably destroy the latter, and can definitely destroy itself. But there is an alternative, to learn from the other. And if the respect dolphins still accord to humans is anything to judge by, there is still something in us that gives rise to hope. Another humanity growing inside the present one. It does not engage in wars. It does not fight with the past. It is mindful of the present. I've come to an old Berber man who's thin and grey to resolve a few questions that torment me a lot. I see a light bursting through you in a hot array. But then, my son, its master you are not. Beware of muddy waters and rewards for your toils. Defend the rose, the dove and the dragon. You can see people around you are winding hell's coils. Show them there's no need to drag on. Remember, no other men's war, no bad rumour, no evil infirmity akin to a she-wolf long unfed. Nothing worse can ever happen to you than the prison inside your head. The solution to our questions is not in becoming dolphins, but in responding to the universe as they do. The mystery of dolphins is in the wonder of their contact with consciousness and the planet. Intraterrestrial, earthlings. It's not about us or them, it's about us with them. Everything that is about division is about death. Everything that is about unity is about life. <laughs> <laughs>